Good morning, church family. We are so glad that you joined us today for Epic Life Online. We hope you've had an incredible Thanksgiving week with your friends and your family. And if it's your first time joining us today, we have a free gift just for you. All you have to do is click the link in the description box and it'll take you to a virtual connection card. Go ahead and fill out that card and we are gonna be sending you a free gift just as a way of saying thank you for joining us today. We have an incredible service prepared, so let's try and get rid of distractions. Let's prepare our heart for worship and get ready for an awesome message. And welcome to Epic Life Online. We're gonna do a new song this morning, y'all. Ready for it? It's real simple. It's all about the presence of Jesus. Sing. I believe, come on, hands up. Your presence comes when we praise you. I believe. Will fall in this place. Now, this is your part. You sing. I've got great expectation. Great expectation. I've got great expectation.
take a moment right now and give everyone an opportunity to give their tithes and offerings. Giving is another way that we worship and we want to give everyone an opportunity to give today. This is your opportunity to give and help support what we are doing here in our community and when you give you get to be a part of the ministry that happens here at Epic Life Church every single day. You know I love the scripture in Proverbs 11:24, where it says the world of the generous gets larger and larger but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. And it's because of your generosity that we believe God is causing your influence to grow, your income to grow, your relationships to grow, and more favor, goodness, and mercy just because of your faithfulness. So we want to encourage you to continue to be faithful with your giving at Epic Life Church. And our Father God promises us in His Word that when we give, that He will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on us. God loves you, He cares about you, He wants to bless you, and He promises us that when we do our part, He will do His part. We like to say here at Epic Life that when we give God our best, He'll take care of the rest. As you're preparing to give, we want to let you know that there are several convenient ways to give to Epic Life today. One of our favorite ways to give is by using a feature called Text to Give. In order to text to give, just text the amount that you want to give to the number on the screen. Let's pray and commit our tithes and our offerings to the Lord as we honor and worship God with our giving today. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give to the work of your kingdom. We thank you that it is a kingdom of mercy, a kingdom of joy, a kingdom of peace, and a kingdom of abundance. We bring our tithes and our offerings now to you, Lord Jesus, and we plant them in your kingdom as a seed of blessing, expecting the rich blessings of heaven to be multiplied to us in return. We thank you, Lord, that you've rebuked the devourer for our sake, and we stand in agreement with your word. We are citizens of your kingdom, and because we have the rights and privileges of a citizen of your kingdom, we stand upon them. Thank you, Lord, that heaven's unlimited resources are ours. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. God bless you as you give today. I want to jump into week three of Family Shift. You know, we've been kind of walking through what it means to drift, and that's what this family shift is really all about. If we're not careful to be intentional about shifting, we'll drift. And we talked about this the last couple of Sundays. When you throw a leaf into water, what happens? It just streams into a stream of water. It just begins to drift with the flow of the current. Our families, our marriages are the same way. If we're not careful, we'll begin to drift with the flow of all that's happening around us, the culture, and you'll begin to move sometimes further away from God and from one another if we're not intentional about moving closer to one another and closer to God. How many of you know that this, this is true? And we, we call it the danger of the drift. It's when we just kind of live life haphazardly, take every day as it comes, no intentionality. And what will happen is that the things that you really want will get further away from you and it is a danger zone. And so we in these next few weeks, want to move out of the danger zone and get into that safety zone and shift our families away from drift. And drift means disappointment. It stands for regret. It stands for isolation. It stands for frustration. It stands for tension. And maybe you're feeling these symptoms, a few or all of them in your marriage and family. Can I tell you today, there's hope. 
You can stop drifting and you can start living with greater intention. And that's what's so important. And so you and I need to make the necessary shifts. We need to refocus so that we can move um, into a, a life of intentionality. And we say this every week. We say this on Monday nights. But I want us to keep declaring this. So say this with me out loud. Say, I declare, I declare. a shift is coming in my marriage, in my family, in my relationships, in my priorities, and in my future. So what we talked about last week is we start with the end in mind. That's how you start when you're developing a vision or direction for your life. You start with the end in mind. And we know Psalm 29 says where there is no vision, people perish. And with no vision, your marriage will die. Dreams will die. Passion dies. Hope dies. You've got to start every marriage, every family, every single person. Start with the end in mind. Great questions. We went over this Monday night and we'll go over this again tomorrow night. Ask yourself the question, who do I want to become as a husband, as a mother, as a wife, as a father? Who, who do I want to become? What do I want my legacy to be? And clear vision will create four things, passion, motivation, direction, and purpose. I don't know about you, but I need all of those things injected into my life Amen. consistently, right? So we're going to start with the end in mind. That's where it all begins. So today, that's a quick recap, but today I want to move into another part of this process, and that is how to hold to core values. If we're going to see vision for our families, you've got to hold the line. You're gonna have to hold to core values. And this is why, because our beliefs determine our behavior. What you believe determines how you live. And we can't just be Sunday going Christians, but we live like we don't believe God Monday through Saturday. We only really come to church in need, but when we, everything starts coming together, that's the first thing that goes. Oh, I'm happy now. Things are moving in my direction. I found the mate. I found what I needed, and then people just start dropping off. And, and what you believe determines how you live. Jeremiah 29. I'm sorry, Jeremiah 9. I want to go to that I know the plans I have for you verse. Jeremiah 9, starting with verse 20. Three, it says, thus saith the Lord, let not the one who is wise and skillful boast in his insight. Let not the one who is mighty and powerful boast in his strength. Let not the one who is rich boast in his temporal satisfactions and earthly abundance. But let the one who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me and acknowledges me and honors me as God and recognizes that without any doubt that I am the Lord who practices loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. Someone say this. Say loving kindness, loving kindness. Justice, justice, and righteousness. righteousness. God, delights God delights in these things. So how many of you know it's important that you and I, if we're going to create values for our family, we need to know what God values. That word boast that's mentioned in our verse it, it, for today is what is most important. That's what boast in. Boast means what is most important. Our culture likes to boast in some things. Our, our culture likes to boast in intellect. Our culture likes to, to boast in power and fame and wealth. They like to, to boast in those things because these are the values that the culture uses to measure success. And there's nothing wrong with any of these things. We should have intellect. We should have success. We should have influence. But these things don't last forever, and they certainly don't guarantee peace and happiness. So at the end of the day, what matters the most is knowing God, yes. knowing that pleasing him is all that matters, and then telling people around us about who he is. Because we were made for God, and we were made by God for God, and that's all that matters. And until you understand that, what you were made for, and what you were made to do, your life will never make sense. 
You'll never find true fulfillment. And so God wants us to put our values. He wants us to place our trust in him and to align our values with his values. And what are his values? According to Jeremiah, we just said it. Kindness, justice, righteousness. These things are very important to our God. God wants our marriage and he wants our family. He wants our relationships to be in alignment with his values. That's what's important to God. As we follow him, these values become important to us too. Romans 12, 2 tells us to challenge the norm of the culture. Stop imitating the ideals and the opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total transformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. Stop just moving and drifting with the culture and the mindset and the world and media and family and friends and coworkers and students and all of these things. We've got to begin to pull away from that and be transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total transformation of how you think. Why? Because that's where the power comes from. If you want more power, you've got to change. You've got to be transformed so that you can live a beautiful life. Why am I not living a beautiful life? Have you been transformed? Why am I not living a life that's filled with peace? And, and why do I allow everything to knock me down and my emotions to get out of control? Don't allow the culture. Stop imitating the culture. Thank you. I will. Is it? Does it matter to us whether we have culture's values or God's values. Does it matter? Because isn't it just a lot easier to go with the flow? Yes. When you're raising kids, sometimes it's just easier when they're bugging you and hey, mama, please, mama, please, 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 mama. It's like, okay, I'll give in. You know, it starts when they're two and you're at Target and they see the, the, the candy aisle. I mean, I'm, I, I would reach for a bag of M&M's. I'm like, will this help? Just let me get my groceries, whatever it takes. Eat the M&M's. They're eating the m and m And then now they're spazzing out after they eat the M&M's. I made it worse. I remember one time, my older sister, she has three kids and she had kids before me, but, and she was with me one day we were going through the store and I think it was Danielle and Danielle's birthday is today. So um, we're gonna um, embarrass her. Happy birthday, baby. And so we... We, I remember I had, I think Nicole and Danielle, they were little and they were in the cart and they were, you know, after a while, your kids nagging just becomes normal, you know, room noise. You don't even hear it. Other people hear it like, are you going to do anything? Do anything about what? Oh, I, that's, I don't even, you don't even hear it. Your brain shuts off after a while. And so they're just nagging their mama, please give me this, give me that. And so, so I gave them something, you know, to kind of make a Barbie or something they wanted just to play with until we got through the, the checkout stand. And my sister was with me. How many of you know that older sisters are very judgmental? How many of you are the older sister in your, in your family member? Okay. Very judgmental. They, they are just looking around going, mm. Mm, I see what you're doing, you know? And so she just knows how to say things that if anybody else said to me, you would no longer be my friend ever, but your sister can say it and they can get away with it. And she looked at me and she said, wow. Sounds like your kids never hear the word no. I said, you're probably right. <laughs> but you can get so just worn down by please, mama, please, and the crying and the begging. And can I tell you, if you don't get used to it and you don't hold to core values when they're two, when they're looking at you, when they're 12, when they're 18, and they're like, mama, please, daddy, come on, let me go to that party. Let me go. No, what are our values? I'm teaching you our values as you are a child so that as you grow up, you already know, don't ask me. My mom used to say, don't ask me after church to go out with somebody because we ain't going. If you ask me, you're in trouble. Now they would call that abuse. <laughs> they would call that toxic parenting, right? I mean, they're coming for our culture. The, the world is coming for our culture because they want to do whatever they can to dilute authority, to, to make it as if anything that lines up with God's values is evil and, and it's the enemy perverting. But what line between obedience to God versus being led by the culture do I draw in my life? 
with my family, with my children, because the reality is the culture wants the blessing from God, but they don't want God. They want everything that God offers, but they don't want God. And disobedience toward God will result in cultural chaos. And we are living in that day today, a total rebellion of disregard of God's ultimate authority in our lives. And that is the real problem that happened in the Bible days when Israel were in the time of judges and Israel wanted to do whatever they wanted to do. And they had rejected God's authority. God's people rejected the authority of God as their king. We're not new, guys. The culture we're living in today is nothing new. This has happened all throughout Scripture. And we see the same problem that the Israelites, God's people, had. And we see it in our culture today. We see people who have rejected God's authority, rejected His Word, and they've substituted the authority of God with the authority of man. And so we see this and, and we see riots, we see destruction, we, we see liberal and political and conservative ideologies that have pitted us all against one another and we're ready to just tear each other's eyeballs out over the craziest stuff and we see it in outright hatred of races and, and, and anybody that's different or anybody that has a different color skin or a different belief system. Now we see it and I believe it stems from a rebellion against God himself that's that's where this is stemming from and it's this biblical perspe perspective that you and I see from that foundational place the issue is that we're all sinners that's where it all begins and we live in a world that's been polluted uh, because of sin by our original parents our original parents who were really dysfunctional at some point um, Adam and Eve and God created them to live in the garden and they began to disregard God's authority. And we see that same attitude, that same seed today. It's the disregard of God's ultimate authority in our lives. Can I tell you, I heard this this week from a pastor who said on Instagram, he said, the problem today in a nutshell is that most people value their thoughts above God's thoughts. And God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. So what are the values? We, we live in a world that does not honor God. And then they wonder where God is. Don't you love it when people say that? How could God? If I get a phone call from somebody, it'll be, I just don't understand why God would let this happen. I don't understand. And the culture kicks God out of everything. We've kicked him out of government. We've kicked him out of schools. We've kicked him out of our jobs. We've kicked him out of our households. And then when something bad happens, we say, where is God? Why, why would a good God, a loving God, let something bad happen to me? I just don't understand. And maybe believing God is your concept, but we don't serve him in every area of our lives. We love God in concept. We love the idea of a good God, but let something bad happen to us and we're just mad, we're running, we are confused, we don't understand. Can I tell you, you can't be the kind of person that does not want bad things to happen because I'm gonna tell you right now, God will use trouble to get your attention. God will use it. Now I'm looking around like, oh, there's more trouble than I expected. That must mean God needs me to look up. God needs me to, to see something that I don't see. It doesn't always mean I'm doing something wrong. It could just mean that there's an attack coming on my life or I need to get an alignment with God's way. Many, many people are out of alignment and they don't understand when you're out of alignment, you have pain that you don't want. The other day, I got up, actually yesterday, I got up early and I walked outside and I saw some, some things that needed to be watered. I'm, I'm now, you know, 92 years old. I'm watering things outside. <laughs> I'm happy to do it. As you get older, you're like pulling weeds. And, and so I, I grabbed, I was watering some things and I had on these slides, you know, these shoes that no one should ever see me in. They're horrible. And, um, and my dog chewed them all up. They're bad. You don't need to know any of that. But anyway, and so I just, I thought an ant was getting my foot. They're, they're, they're open toed shoes. I thought an ant was biting my, my foot. And so I'm like, oh, you know how you just kind of lift your foot and shake the shoe. And when I did, y'all, it was the tiniest little bump. I don't even remember doing it. My second toe just hit the top of my shoe and it bent under. And I thought I broke my foot. I broke it. 
It's not good. And, and the pain and the rest of the day, it just kept swelling. All it was was out of alignment. And I had to just kind of wrap it. And now I'm wearing boots because within 24 hours, I put it in alignment. It's still sore, but the pain came from being out of alignment. But it was the smallest, just the tiniest little hair's breadth off. I didn't even really notice it. I couldn't believe that that little tiny bit of a, just a little uh, hit could cause that much pain. And, and you and I need to understand sometimes the pain that we're in could be caused because we're not in alignment with what God wants because you and I, we got to know. See, miracles will come after a wilderness season. Look through your Bible. Every great miracle, every great breakthrough came after a season of struggle. And we want breakthrough without struggle. We want miracles without problems. Can I tell you today, that's not how it works. We've got to stay in alignment. We live in a world that is polluted and corrupt and cursed. That's the world you live in today. You're not cursed, you're not polluted, you're not corrupt. As long as you align your values with God's values, he'll get you through this difficult life with joy. He'll make sure you have everything you need. He'll make sure you flourish, your family's protected. He'll make sure the shoes you wear for 40 years won't ever wear out like he did the Israelites. They had one pair of shoes. They wandered for 40 years and their shoes never wore out. That's the benefit and the protection of making God's values your values. See, everybody has something that's very valuable to them. The old English word to describe value of God is worth-ship. What is it that we we value? It's worth-ship. What is it that is the object of our devotion? Because that's where you're going to invest your energy. That's where you're going to invest your time. And then wherever you invest your energy and time, your expectation is that's where you're going to feel fulfilled. That's what's going to feel like it's meaningful. But this is how we drift because we begin to focus and pour into and invest in things that are not what God has intended. It looks good. It sounds good. But sometimes we're worshiping the wrong thing. The culture says money. Worship money. The the culture says possessions. Worship possessions. Intelligence. Beauty. Power. But the more you The more you pursue money, the more broke you're going to feel. I promise you. The more you just pursue possessions, you're never going to have enough. The more you pursue beauty, you're just going to feel ugly. I don't even have to finish those sentences. You know what I'm talking about. The more that you pursue power, none of these things are necessarily wrong, but they'll cause us to drift if they become our highest values. They will. They can't give us what we long for. They are default settings. They are what we do that are counterfeit to make us feel like we're doing something that matters. But what will happen is that that, that if we don't shift, that that drift will create the agenda for our lives. And they will become and stay our priorities. And what's better is actually having a real, authentic relationship with Jesus. Let everything come from there. Our beliefs determine our behavior. Hold to core values. I got to hurry here. I got to hurry. Psalm 15 and verse one says, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on Ebor and cast no slurs on others? Who despises a vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord? Who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind? Who lends money to the poor without interest? Who does not accept a bribe against the innocent? Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Notice the values David mentions in this scripture because he valued truth. His words reflected the truth from his heart. He valued kindness. He does his neighbor no harm. He valued honesty. He keeps a promise even when it hurts. He valued justice. He accepted no bribe against the innocent. Notice the outcome. Notice the benefit of the person who is guided and driven by these kinds of values and principles. The last scripture says, you will never be shaken. I I don't know why we're not more excited about that because that's the moral 
chaos, the spiritual chaos going all around us, it's happening all around us, will create a world around us where we'll feel like we're being shaken. But in the middle of your kids who are strung out on drugs, in the middle of your spouse who can't find a job and you feel like you're gonna lose your house, in the middle of a difficult, devastating situation where your marriage looks like it's over, can I tell you today, you will never be shaken if in that storm, in that trouble, you'll make a determination. I'm gonna hold to the core values. I'm not, I'm not moving, I'm not wavering. This is what I believe because what you believe determines how you live. And can I tell you, if I'm saying anything today that makes you feel like this life that I'm describing is unattainable, let me, let me help you. The goal isn't perfection. It's progress. The goal isn't perfection. It's progress. I'm making progress. My, my family's better this year than it was last year. My money's a little bit better this year than it was last year. We want everything to change on a dime instead of saying, God, I'm in this fight. You're developing my faith, my courage. You're putting a backbone of steel to stand in the culture. I need it now when my baby's two and three and four and seven and eight because what's coming is gonna even be more hard to stand. And I've gotta learn how to stand now and not be moved by all the, the voices of the people around me. And here's, here's what will, what's so true. Your, your direction, not your intention, will lead to your destination. Amen. Yes. Your direction, not your, you have every intention of going a different way. I'm telling you, when I worked in my, uh, years ago, worked and lived in Miami, I was, I'd get on 836, Boom, I know exactly where I'm going. I was going the wrong way the whole time. 20 minutes going east, I'm supposed to be going west or whatever. I should even point because I'm not really sure what east and west is. I, I could Listen, I, that was before GPS, even with GPS. I don't know that I could get home without my GPS now. I gotta make sure that I've got a GPS and my GPS will tell me where I am and my GPS will tell me where I'm going. It'll give me a play-by-play -play till I get where I'm going. It'll tell me if there's trouble ahead or if, you know, whatever is coming ahead, it'll tell me. And the good news is that's just copying the voice of the Holy Spirit because that's who he is to your life. He'll make sure if you'll plug him in, if you'll, if you'll lean into him, if you'll say today before I leave this house, Holy Spirit, lead me, guide me, strengthen me. I don't want to just end up somewhere today. I don't want to just live with just this, I hope, I intended for it to be better. I didn't intend for that divorce. I didn't intend to not be there for my child. It is not about intention. It's not about sincerity. Can, I, can you hear me today? The devil does not care how sincere you are. You've got to set your intention. The Bible says to, face, to, to set your face like flint, which is the hardest structural material. I will not be moved. The world does not decide my values for me and my family. I will decide based on the voice of the Holy Spirit and the word of God. I don't really care that you want to get involved in all of these things at school. It's going to take us away from being involved in church. And that's how my mother raised us. I don't care. You're not being a cheerleader and you're not going to be in sports. But mom, I could be great at all that. And she'd say, you really can't. You need to sing. You can't dance. You're not that. And she loved me enough not to tell me I can dance a little bit, but I didn't need and she said, when I was a little girl, and I would beg her to do things, and she knew that were, that was going to lead me away. That wasn't in that wasn't uh, in the in going in the right direction. I just wanted to enjoy that season of my life. I just wanted to have great memories. And, be, and she said, no, because if you don't stand and be and, and and save yourself for what God's called you to do, you're going to wear yourself out. You're going to open yourself up to experiences you don't you don't need relationships and teachers that like our kids dating at 13 14 what are y'all doing don't let your kids date don't let them date no ma'am not in this world you they gotta wait well you know they're they just they they're just going together where are they going nowhere be friends be friends you're not going nowhere you're gonna be friends and that's it we're not going anywhere. We, we've got to hold the line. We are living in a world that wants our families destroyed. The fabric of our family is, is not valued 
as much as we would like it to be. I believe that it is more than we hear about. But you and I have to hear, knowing that the language of the culture is screaming to tear down the, the, the nuclear family. That just means, I don't care if it's little or big. I heard it. I'm going to make sure that my family, as, as for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. Yes. We're serving the Lord. We're holding to, to, to values, core values. I don't really have time for this. Can y'all give me like two more minutes yes. and then we're going to close? Okay. L here we are living in a day where wrong has become right and bad has become good. I want to read this to you very quickly. Barna Group, according to the Barna Group, um, which they do polls and statistics, 83% of adults, 83% of adults are concerned about the moral condition of the nation. The report says, given that 84% of all adults consider themselves to be Christian. That's wrong already, should be Christians, but anyway. They have good reason to worry about the moral state of the country. In fact, many of their own views conflict with the moral teachings of their professed faith. Of the 10 moral behaviors evaluated in Barna's study, a majority of Americans believed, a majority of Americans, 84% of Americans say they're Christian, okay? Out of the 10 moral behaviors evaluated in Barna's study, a majority of Americans believed that each of these activities, these three, were morally acceptable. Morally acceptable. Gambling, 61%. Cohabitation, 60%. Sexual fantasies, 59%. Nearly half of the adult population felt that two other behaviors were also morally acceptable. Having an abortion, 45%. Having a sexual relationship with someone of the opposite sex other than their spouse, 42%. About one-third of the population gave the stamp of approval to pornography, 38%. Profanity, 36%. Drunkenness, 35%. Homosexuality, 30%. The activity, the activity that garnered the least support was using non-prescription drugs at 17%. These are staggering statistics. And it sounds like what was happening in the book of Judges where the people just did whatever was right in their own eyes. They loved God, but they, they just didn't, they just did whatever they felt like doing. And that's the world that we live and it's continuing to deteriorate here in America. And you can find that, or Google it and look for, your, for yourself and find out more. But here's what we're going to have to do as I close this. Here's, here's the key thought that's running through all of our messages the next few weeks. Every family ends up somewhere, but few families end up somewhere on purpose. Everything in your life that you have, you have it on purpose. Everything. Everything you have. Everything you've accomplished, everything you've achieved, everything you've done, you have it because there was purpose behind it. So what do you have to do? You've got to decide the source of your beliefs. The source of your beliefs. Are your beliefs going to be driven by God's word or about what you think, about the culture? You know, we don't, don't want to, you know, the whole family believes this and, and I might as well just be the only one. I don't want to be the only one that doesn't believe it. I'll probably, oh, I don't want to be the bad guy. I don't want to be the Karen. So you got to decide who and what is going to determine your beliefs. Proverbs 4, 23 says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Your mind will justify what your heart believes. And if you believe the lies of the world, your mind will find a way to justify that. It'll find a, a way to justify that behavior. We're seeing it all over the place. We're seeing it everywhere we look. Number two, determine the values that matter most. We're gonna go over this tomorrow night. We're gonna write these things down. What are the values? That's why this is so important because at the end of this series, we're gonna know exactly. We're gonna have a mission statement. We're gonna know these things. We're gonna answer these questions and they're not easy. That's why we're gonna do it together. We're gonna help each other. Write down the values that matter most. Create a value-driven culture. Do you know the number one influence on a child's life is? Do you know what a, the number one influence on your child's life is? Not their peers, their parents. 
It's their parents. What are the non-negotiable qualities for our family that we are committed to live by? What are those intangibles that will set our family apart? What is it that we're driven by? We're going to state it. We're going to state those things because we're believing that God wants to do something great in and through our family. We have a mission. You might be a single family. You might be a single mom, a single dad. You might be someone who's divorced. You might be someone who's starting over, someone who made mistakes, and now you're like, I don't know what to do. Listen, all we need to do is say, God, I'm going to get back in alignment with your values. I'm going to hold the core values. I'm not going to be moved. I don't care how hard people scream. I don't care how mad they get with, a, with joy in my heart and a smile on my face. I'm going to hold to core values. Father, we just thank you for this time together today. God, this word is life. It's life to us. It's not easy. But if we will be occupied with your word, we won't be preoccupied with everything else. And God, we know that in our family, our desire is to have good success. God, we desire good success for our marriages, for our family. And God, today, help us see that good success never takes us away from our families. Good success is not staring at a computer until our eyes are blurry and swollen. Good success always gives us time to serve you, to be in your house on Sundays with our families. That is good success. I pray that we would be blessed with good success. Keep our eyes on you. So Father, today, thank you that you're a God of kindness, justice, and righteousness. I refuse to look to the world to determine what is most important, but I look to you to determine my beliefs and my values. God, I pray for our families today for wisdom and strength to align our beliefs and our values with what is most important to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just continue praying with me for just a moment, I wanna pray for anyone in this room. If you're away from God, you, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. You've never aligned your life up your behaviors, your beliefs with who Jesus is. And today you're feeling like, man, something's drawing me. That something is a who, it's the Holy Spirit. He's drawing you to truth because this is what you're made for. You're made by God to serve God, to love God. And he wants to love you. And he's asking for you to surrender. And I know you might feel today that you're unworthy and you've made a lot of mistakes. Join the club. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we've all had to take the step of faith and receive salvation. Receive it by the help of the Holy Spirit. Just accept it and say, thank you, Jesus, for loving me. But you need to know that you're a sinner saved by grace and that you need forgiveness. You need forgiveness. If you're in this room today and you would say, that's me, would you pray for me? I wanna serve God. I don't wanna be a Sunday Christian. I want my behaviors and my life to line up with God's. I want to serve God. Come on. Let's pray this out loud, all of us together. Say, dear Jesus, I come to you today and I know I've made mistakes, but today, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and be the Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Today, I receive your love and I receive your forgiveness, and I know I am a son, I am a daughter of the King. I am a child of God. Thank you for loving me. I surrender everything in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, let's all stand together. Let's worship God in this room. Let's worship.